Life is a funny thing. Sometimes it brings you joy, sometimes it brings you sadness, but meaning is found in the act of being. When you stop trying to solve everything, you come to realize that all of the answers are in front of you and have been all along. Babies are not ignorant, they're profoundly aware. I calmed my mind recently following a serious mental breakdown after making 23 theories on Mort from Madagascar. It was exhausting, but I've come out of this with a renewed sense of clarity that has granted me all of the answers. What does that mean? How does this work? I don't know. But the result was a series of jokes I made coming true and then answering every single question I have ever had about Pixar. This metaphysical cipher has finally allowed me to figure out Monsters, Inc. What do you mean, you might ask? What needs solving? Hasn't there been way too many Pixar theories? Don't think of this as a theory, then. Think of it as the key to every plot hole ever. It's not only logical, but poetic and sensible and likely. This video will serve to unify everything I've ever done. A few months ago, I made a wild video that made a lot of bold claims about the Pixar company b &L. I called it the Twisted Nest of Pixar, and that's becoming more true than ever. I hope you've seen it, and I hope you've heeded my warning, which suggested that you watch my three theories on Roz, three theories on Syndrome, and two theories on the Incredibles government, because everything's about to connect perfectly. And this second Pixar dissertation is about to grind along the fringes of sanity and go straight off the rails. Hello, I am the Theorizer. <sighs> Baby Smitty. The second I laid eyes on this character, I felt the overwhelming urge to hate him. He's just... I don't know how to put it. For six months now, I've been attacking him on social media. I made some bold claims intended to be slanderous about how he's an evolved form of the Spanish flu, how he's an anomalous Atlantic mime, and how he's the gastropod godfather. Whatever that means. People have understandably accused me of losing it. If you still don't remember, Baby Smitty is that little blue slug that wanders around with the preschool during the events of Monsters, Inc., and then bites Mike Wazowski's hand for no damn reason. Yes, this character with 30 seconds of screen time has earned my profound hatred. I can just feel that something's going on here. His name is, yes, literally, Baby Smitty, and it's presumably because there's already another slug character named Smitty. He's the door shredder guy. This is the first clue that something's going on here. They could have named this child anything they wanted, but instead they named him Baby Smitty so as to relate him back to the older Smitty. It signifies that blue slugs likely turn more green as they get older, and it means there's some fascinating continuity going on beneath the surface. In fact, all of the kids in this preschool seem to be related back to the other older monsters we've seen. There's a whole world out there beyond the immediate events of the film. Let me elaborate. I have reason to believe that there is yet another Smitty hiding somewhere out there, an adolescent Smitty, dare I say. When Mike and Sully leave their apartment, we see some kids playing jump rope, and sitting right there on the steps is yet another blue slug with four arms. He's holding a soccer ball, and he says hi to them. With all of this in mind, I could easily believe that this is the house where the Smitty family lives, and in the window we see a giant eyeball. Perhaps this is the head of the Smitty family, and it's kind of disturbing that they get so big. It is an interesting comparison to make, though, because in Monsters University we see a giant slug octopus librarian who fits similar descriptions. This is the scary part. The Smitty family is well aware of Mike and Sully, the door shredder Smitty is a super fan, and baby Smitty is friggin' terrifying. They live right next door. Not only that, but Smitty shreds doors on Mike and Sully's own scare floor, which displays how they're always close behind them. This scare floor is a very critical location. It's the nexus of multiversal travel, and Boo's bedroom is already a very important part of my infinite Mobius Matryoshka theory. When door shredder Smitty arrives on the scene, his job is to get rid of any unfit scare candidates, perhaps kids who are too jaded, too old, so on and so forth. I believe most of the Smitty family is indeed employed here, each with their own role to play, and then there's the baby of the bunch. I want to be clear that I have reason to believe all of this because of the fact that this isn't just some random field trip baby Smitty's on. He's there. Every. Day. This is a daycare 
at the facility. I spotted this teacher in the company ad, and multiple spots on the bonus disc confirm all of this too. I could tell all of this and it just kept getting confirmed, but it's important because it all around proves that they're all here all day every day. Baby Smitty is a suspicious, pernicious, vicious thing, but I'm still not sure how. So I kept thinking and thinking, and then everything clicked. And this is about to get unlike anything you've ever seen before. After uploading the Matroshka video, I received comments from so many people asking how the giraffe fits in. Yes, the giraffe. The bonus disc is filled to the brim with detail, more than any other bonus disc I've ever laid eyes upon, and it's all for a very particular reason. A while back, YouTuber Edache scanned this disc as well and was severely put off by the giraffe rented a whole theater just to zoom in and screen and confirm its existence. The YouTuber's personal understanding was that Pixar was just messing around for technical reasons, but something nobody has realized is that this is one of the missing pieces to my theory. What is the giraffe, you ask? Well, it's the two-dimensional height chart in Boo's bedroom. It's suddenly missing in one shot, and then it reappears. It's eerie, because this thing apparently moves on its own accord. No, not apparently. It does, because the crazy part is that it can in fact be seen waddling along behind Mike and Sully, following them to work. That is utterly creepy. Even creepier is the fact that if you really hunt on the bonus disc, there's another deleted animation test where we see the giraffe sneaking in and out of Boo's bedroom. You might be inclined to dismiss this. I'm not. How can this thing possibly move? What is it? How could this even work? It would have to make a sneaky beeline for the door at the moment where it needs to disappear. But it didn't take me long to realize. It does. At the exact moment in question, Boo leans up and points at her door. Sully assumes she's referring to the monster scaring her, but in fact, she's talking about the stealth giraffe that just ran through and replaced itself. This still sounds insane and ridiculous at face value, but luckily, it's just the missing piece I've been looking for. So is it some sort of monster? The answer is no. It's been a fixture of Boo's bedroom for quite some time, and this seems to be the two worlds colliding with full force. You'll see what I mean. Have you heard of the Mans and the Mons? It's a neat little story on the bonus disc detailing how monsters and humans lived in harmony until the humans bullied the monster's ugliness so bad that they had to flee to an enchanted island. There, they ate the food which made them scarier, and they began to spook humans out of revenge. They continued the tradition to this very day. This story upends a lot. I've constantly been saying that the doors go back in time, but that seems to be a falsehood. They constantly refer to them as the human world and the monster world. This also fits perfectly with the idea of nested realities, not time periods. I've been thinking over this little short for quite some time, and it seems to be a sort of bedtime story being told to younger generations. It's vague and seems to be somewhat metaphorical, what with enchanted islands, and so I've thought and thought and thought and felt like maybe it was a portal to a hidden world, perhaps underground or something? So I scanned that bonus disc again and the answer hit me hard. I recall seeing an advertisement from the Monstropolis Travel Agency advertising a trip to the Bermuda Triangle. I believe the Enchanted Island is actually through a portal at the core of the Bermuda Triangle, which is why this world's food made them scarier. How could a random travel agency get clearance to send civilians to the human world, unless it doesn't require portals at all because it's right outside the barriers of this hidden city, just outside of humanity's reach. The cancelled original sequel was even going to be called Lost in Scaradice. They banish monsters to the Himalayas because of how far it is from the entrance. This sequel did, however, imply time dilation, and mixing that with the eastern seaboard repetitions, the nighttime scarability, and the Sid comic you've all mentioned, I do believe there is no time travel. The Mans and the Mons confirms it. It's a sort of propaganda, presumably by someone like Waternoose. It also fully confirms hostility between monsters and humans. In the Himalayas, we see a village where we catch a glimpse of how scaring looks from the human side. Lights constantly flashing, kids constantly screaming, villages in uproar. Hold on. How would the human world not realize something fishy is going on? The human government must know that this is happening. It can't not be that way. Based on the history and the statistics, how can Mike and Sully traumatize adults at camp and just get away with it? How can they banish unruly monsters to the human world with such ease? Oh. 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 <laughs> it 
not simple, really. It's not that it's easy. It's that they've already been caught. It's happening. You feel it? It's like a, it's like a chill in the air. The puzzle. I did it. Oh, I did it. The humans, they know. It's all a trap. Okay, so Boo's bedroom is the nexus of multiversal overlap. It's the central focal point. I hinted at this in the Twisted Nest video. It's at the forefront of BNL's universal merge. It's the gateway between worlds, containing the layers below it in the form of toys. It's a crucial moment of overlap. But up until this point, I assumed it was all just a byproduct of the situation, reality bending in on itself. But don't you see? Don't you understand? It's on purpose. This is all fake. It's all a setup. A lie. This isn't Boo's bedroom, because there is no Boo's bedroom. This is a test. It's a facility. This is all BNL. The entire bedroom is an experiment by BNL, monitored 24-7 to study the monsters so they can take over their world. They want Monstropolis because it's the motherlode, the nexus of the multiverse, portals galore. All of their multiversal products are scattered amidst this fake room, all designed to catch the monsters. The giraffe is not a monster. It is BNL's modus operandi. It is robotic. The giraffe is the equivalent of a robotic animal inconspicuously recording nature footage. Wait a second, wait a second. No, I, I'm not crazy. I heard that. This is familiar. Where do I know this from? <gasps> because... Um, it could let in a draft? When I was younger, I always thought I heard giraffe. Never draft. I'm not alone in this. I've seen others online who heard this too. I bet this is purposeful. If you don't believe me, just take a look at the wall right behind him because holy shit, there are literally giraffes right there. And get this, a toy giraffe angled perfectly as an inconspicuous camera. They're trying to tell us this was all a setup. It is complete and utter recon. The bedroom is a B&L Venus flytrap. Do you have any idea how much this changes? It means Boo was supposed to be captured. They put this child there for the sole purpose of getting snatched so they could send in the giraffe or any other spyware. Remember, we've established in the previous video that Boo has been scream extracted many times. This is how she knew to open the secret door, and it's also why she's, strangely enough, comfortable around Water Noose at first. Randall keeps going back for her, and even mentions how she needs to take off a few pounds. This is how the giraffe was already in their world when the film began. And I mean, let's take a closer look at this supposed bedroom. Firstly, the brightness of this moonlight is impossible. It'd have to be more like a street lamp, but it's angled in such a way that it would mean she'd need to be close to it. I don't hear any cars, only faint crickets and a subtle humming. A humming, you say? Like an industrial spotlight? Maybe. I would also like to highlight that this nursery mobile tilts slightly the instant we see it, even though this bedroom was completely empty. I do believe this is because there were people in this room mere seconds before Sully returned Boo. They set the stage, as it were. Randall and Waternoose were playing right into b &L's hands. This is why Boo has no parents looking for her. The entire time she's gone, there are people watching this whole thing. Not even at the end, when she returns and is screaming and laughing, does anyone step in. Not a peep. All right, brace yourselves. This is about to go up to 11. How do you think BNL is accomplishing this? Yes, it would seem as though they've kidnapped a little girl and forced her to walk worlds. If this truly is the Incredibles universe, then could it really be true that she's a superhero? Could it be? How else? She's full of energy that can power worlds. She's used as a lure. She can be scream extracted over and over again, and for f**k's sake, she literally teleports around. This is complete insanity, but something's still not adding up. I know BNL has the ability to kidnap supers, that's not an issue, but something is just not clicking here. There's more to this story. Oh. Oh. I, I am so sorry. I don't know how to prepare you for this. They were telling us the whole time. Can't you see what I've been saying? The whole film is bombarding us with it. They even do it again in the climax itself. One question. 
Why would it just be the giraffe? BNL is a company run and owned by robots. Why would they stop there? Wouldn't all of the toys here, these Matroshka Centrals themselves, be spyware too? The technology in the Incredibles world is so powerful that I've claimed Mirage as a robot. Do you see now? The giraffe isn't the only one being sent through. Boo is too! She teleports around, she has no parents, she's filled with energy, everyone calls her an it. She speaks like a machine learning algorithm squealing kitty all over the place. She gives him tons of spyware as a last ditch recon op, and when she falls asleep, she just shuts down. This child is not a child at all. Case in point, the cereal. She eats it repeatedly and doesn't die. Why would I be so insane to think that? Because I've read the ingredients. I don't know about you, but I've never heard of an ordinary human being who can eat uranium, mercury, neurotoxins, and sulfuric acid. She physically can't be a human. She mimics one perfectly like Mirage, ever the puppet with strings. BNL has been aware of the monster world for ages now, spying, prying, planning a takeover of the world without energy as they use the same child targeting algorithm that the monsters themselves use. The end of the film is far, far darker this way. No wonder Smitty is shredding so many dead doors indeed. So this whole film was a plot staged by BNL to gain access to the master reality so they could collapse all of the layers. How deep does this go? Well firstly, thanks to my commenters, the ultimate proof can be found in cars. <gasps> Welcome to the Himalayas! Oh, that abominable snowplow! So this is unequivocal proof of films within films. But there's something else here to mention, and like A113 in the Pizza Planet truck, it's another symbolic representation of the states of these universes. The Chinese food boxes. This brand is located in every single universe except Monsters, Inc., where it's slightly off. This is because BNL owns fast food chains, but again, they've failed to assimilate Monstropolis. There is nexus upon nexus upon nexus as they try to break reality, and this restaurant is a nexus, hence Marlin literally being on the wall. BNL is trying to ram through these realities with a vengeance. Who are they? What are they? Oh dear, oh, oh, the satisfaction, it's obvious. They're the humans who remember the monsters, the war. They remember the parallel worlds. That's how they've done all this. But here comes the true bombshell. Here comes the mind f to end all mind f**ks. Mirage. The syndrome theories. He's tied in. He's creating increasingly human robots. It's all a part of the same thing. Remember, he did all of this for the government. I told you they were shady, even back in the days where I had a text-to-speech narrating my videos. The Incredibles government syndicate, from their theories, has direct ties to Syndrome from his theories, and they are building and funding massive quantities of artificial intelligence to consume the multiverse. You see? This government that suppressed supers and rules the world is BNL. I'm in a state of shock. I'm in a state of panic. It all makes sense. Oh, oh, oh! The Mons swam and swam. The narrator of the Mans and the Mons! It should sound familiar because it's Agent Rick Dicker himself. They remembered the war! This isn't a story for monster children. It's for humans who are being inducted into their little cult. Little propaganda. Little cartoons. Oh, oh, now it makes sense why they targeted Winston and Evelyn Dever. It was their link to the telecommunications industry. They want to air their preemptive Matroshka Buzz Lightyear shows, sure. But don't you see what's happening here? BNL is airing violence to children so they can desensitize them. This is what we see causes all of the dead doors. BNL is the true cause of the power crisis. Robbing the energy led to Waternew seeking out the greatest source, which was Boo's bedroom, the trap. Syndrome is a prime example of this violent fanboy youth. I've solved it. This is why The Incredibles is so violent. I bet the government created superheroes to fight violence publicly and have children enjoy it. I mean, if it were poetic, they'd harvest the genes of monsters, which could be why they have owl creatures and stuff. It should be abundantly clear what I'm saying. BNL is the National Supers Agency, the NSA. They have secret ocean bases to try and pinpoint the Bermuda Triangle. And Rick Dicker even vacations to one just like the monsters. I'm shaking internally and externally. 
But wait, there's more. Because speaking of three-letter acronyms, the CDA is a crucial factor here too. A child-protecting team of monsters led by Roz after she quit being a scarer, at least according to my theories. But I do believe Waternoose and Roz aren't as clueless about all of this as one might think. Waternoose says she's seen too much, implying bad ramifications, and then babbles about how everyone's doomed as he's carried off, and it's because he knows something. His family created the portals after all. Something's fishy, and I'm not just talking about this Bermuda crustacean. The CDA sees Mike and Sully's apartment light up, but they let it slide, even though it's a sure sign of boo. I mean, everyone's suspicious here, see their theories for more on that. Remember when Roz confronted Mike and Sully in the university and said she'd always be watching them? Why? They did nothing wrong except get on BNL's radar. I wonder how many kids are decoys adding to the crisis. Perhaps Roz has a counter giraffe she sent through, which is why she let Boo escape to begin with. All of her employees are yellow, she could have spotted it waddling out, and of course, even the news guy who, wink wink, is another close A113 misprint uses telecommunication to say he's always watching them. They are targets after being seen by human adults, and I don't think it's any coincidence that Boo smiled as she smashed their telecommunications device. But before I wrap around to Baby Smitty, I need to reach the holy grail of Pixar theorizing, which I found after months of analyzing. You can probably feel it. We're building to one massive key that will answer everything related to BNL and Pixar itself. I hope you've seen everything I've ever said about them. So should I state the obvious? Robots like Boo and Mirage don't seem like robots. They are so realistic it isn't even funny. It took mental gymnastics, but also common sense, for me to reach said conclusion, but there are certain things that robots notoriously cannot replicate, certain autonomy and emotion and willpower. Recently we got a movie named Soul, which focused on this most elusive factor, the difference between man and machine. Boo isn't just a machine learning algorithm going around repeating Kitty. She knows what kitties are, and she draws them on her wall as if she's learning about them with a purpose. Is she artificial or a human? I also need to try and figure out how Cars ties into this, because evidently it does, but don't even get me started on what these things are supposed to be. Are they artificial? Human-like, though? I still need to bring Wally into this, but I can't for the life of me figure out how robots fall in love. <laughs> I was right. I was right. I said it years ago, and I was right. The toys are possessed. BNL is using souls to power their machines. Oh my. Oh, that's the key. That's the truth. They've been trying to tell us for decades it's right there. They trick you into thinking this robot is actually a child, and then they make the movie about robots who are human who fall in love, Wally and Eve. They even joke in Monsters Inc. about children's souls possessing a garbage cube. Sound familiar? And BNL's cars are living proof of an unholy merge. Human machines. This is BNL's endgame, full corporate control. We even catch a glimpse of Mike's new car, which literally tries killing any monsters inside of it. Chomp. Don't you see how much sense this makes? Please understand. This is why 22 was so hesitant to head to Earth. Everyone is being brainwashed into obsession, which we see drains their souls, ready to be harvested by BNL. She finally has a fun experience with Joe and a cat, then proceeds to birth into this kitty. Kitty. Kitty! Don't you see? 22 could very damn well be Boo. Emotion is the link to the soul. When kids turn inside out and display mass amounts of emotion, their soul is vulnerable and the monsters feed upon it. Randall's Scream Extractor rips the souls out of children. They are energetic. They wanted Boo because 22 is inherently already loose. This is the same film that has Joe Gardner's score, like some sort of Matryoshka link to jazzy fever dream. Waternoose stops it with evil. Roz stops it with heroism. This brings me to the most critical of all points, the toys. Many are BNL products, such as Buzz Lightyear. Many act as soul funnels for children's imaginations, which I already determined also greatly helped power Monstropolis. Do you see what I'm saying? Do you see what I'm getting at? For years, years, I said Andy's ancestors helped watch over him in the form of toys. Now I have proof that this can be the case. The first film feels like two dads fighting over his son, the birth dad, the stepdad. Woody has no memory from beyond a very specific point in his past, and he watches over Andy like a father. <laughs> I did it! Yes! Finally! I need to down several chill pills with a gallon of chamomile. Somebody stop me before I... 
We're too late! I've read too many of your comments and ascended one too many layers for my own good. It does seem to be the case that, well, if varying levels of reality all coexist within a recursive stack, then why would our layer be exempt? Um... Wait, what is B&L? The company that owns fictional Pixars and runs the world and has a monopoly on merch and the economy? Um, this should sound strikingly familiar. BNL is Disney. BNL is Disney! Oh my f This is how our world ties into the theory. This is how the story drags in our lair. The fictional premise is that BNL is based off of Disney itself. This is most certainly what they were going for when they created the idea of BNL in the first place. The freakiest part in all of this is that Disney's late acquisition of Blue Sky Studios would canonize my Katie theory by proxy. Because if all the layers are involved in a nest of insignificant Easter eggs, then the multiversal goddess would technically be involved too. But obviously that's not intentional. That's just a fun byproduct of the insane fact that BNL is Disney. My main concern now is that Disney's in the housing market and people are already comparing them to BNL online. Layers of reality are converging. Luckily, we can finally solve Baby Smitty with all of this. On the night of Boo's escape, she ambushes a sushi restaurant named Harry Housen's. The CDA bursts onto the scene with full force. In later interviews, a scarefloor monster named Lanky Schmidt claims that Boo used laser eyes and another monster says she shook him like a dog with her mind powers, which is confirmed by yet another monster. This is all very suspicious because the Incredibles and Monsters Inc. overlap like mad to the point where they even share similar logos and this led to all of you commenting about the very viral theory which identifies the possibility that Jack-Jack is the real culprit. How is this possible? Well, Jack-Jack has all of those powers and the power to overlap dimensionally. How bizarre. Why is is making so much sense. The strangest part, though, is that it occurs at such a coincidental moment right amidst Boo's chaos. So here's the kicker. Here's my theory. Here we go. Boo jumped up on the counter and screamed Boo at all of the monsters in a sort of climactic moment of terror. Remember what I said about this restaurant being a nexus point? Nay, a weak spot between universes? Well, I believe this entire night of horrors was a controlled event by BNL from the other side. This restaurant is so literally fishy that I might be inclined to brand it as the weakest spot. The center of the Monstropolis portal. The Bermuda Triangle. What is their logo? The restaurant is named after a famous real-life animator, and it's because this whole situation is literally breaking down layers of reality and combining the easter eggs from our lair. Still don't believe me? Well, guess what this restaurant is filled to the brim with? The Chinese food boxes. Are you kidding me? This is insane. This is insane. So BNL is using children to minimize suspicions and keep them secure. Boo, Jack Jack, and someone else another baby. A changeling to swap universes with physical conservations. Now, I didn't know who this was. And then every single layer of reality broke, and I collapsed into a pit of my own broken existence. The bonus disc ends with a series of bloopers that are literally showing how the film itself was filmed and has actors acting the act. Matroshka. This is not what gets me, though. What gets me is that it finishes with a literal stage play retelling the events of the film. And who plays Boo? It's none other than Baby Smitty. Everything is collapsing. It's the way he stared down Lanky Schmidt himself that got me, so much so that I tweeted about it without fully understanding what I was talking about, but it's him. This is what the giraffe teaches us about swapping universes. Baby Smitty is a changeling with Jack-Jack, and from that night forward, he's... Oh, is it possible that Baby Smitty has no older sibling? That this was Baby Smitty until the night of living hell? Perhaps, perhaps, but that's not the point. Do you see what I'm really getting at? Whichever method, whatever happened, however it occurred, it did. BNL has been sending in decoy children to prep the universe for their takeover. Jack Jack's first big outpouring of power was during the short film Jack Jack Attack. Near the end of this, BNL inventor himself, Syndrome, arrives at the doorstep and makes a joke. Then I would have been going around wearing a big BS, and you understand why I couldn't go with that. What an absolute coincidence. I'm not sure what this thing is. It likely came through at some point, somehow. But I don't believe this is a robot. At least not entirely. First of all, he has razor-sharp teeth. Slugs don't have teeth. Not like this. Look at older Smitty. Those are teeth. They even make a point of how he can wear braces. These, on the other hand, are shards of 
bone. He slithers around like a leviathan and has a mouth like a lamprey. Off the top of my head, he shares a ton of characteristics with both leviathans and changelings from the show Supernatural, which is a weird coincidence. But all this time, my jokes were accurate. He supersedes gastropods, he is a virus, spreading BNL in the Atlantic hidden city. Baby Smitty is dumb, uneducated, and parrots Mike Wazowski around like he's learning. His eyes are black, dead, vacant sockets, which is absolutely nothing like older Smitty or the other version of this child that we see earlier near the apartment. This thing is a Smitty, but not. They chose him because of his proximity to Mike, Sully, and most importantly, Boo. I also believe Roz has ties back to this family. Why do I believe this? Because we've established that the slugs turn green, they get massive, and they might turn into old ladies who like administrative positions. She doesn't have the correct arm count, which leads me to believe she's only on one side of the family, but I do believe there's a slug conspiracy of sorts going on here in some form. Always watching. The film is quite upfront about it all. This is why Mike chose Baby Smitty to play Boo in the theatrical production. He sounds the same. He is a replacement, an imperfect one. And this brings me to my final conclusion and about what he's here to do. I believe BNL is already infiltrating Monstropolis. Not in the form of robots, that's just the equivalent of their reconnaissance drones. No, I think Baby Smitty is infectious. I believe BNL is replacing the citizenry one member at a time. At first I thought there's no way, but then I started getting advertisements for the new Monsters at Work TV show. I haven't seen the whole thing, but here's the confusing part. I think I'm right, and I think the evidence is overwhelming. In the show, we meet Gary Gibbs and Rose. Gary Gibbs is like Mike Wazowski, but blue and evil. Rose is like Roz, but she likes Gary Gibbs and is even less bubbly. These are cloned villains who showed up out of nowhere shortly after the events of the film. Roz seems to be playing along. The bonus disc adds the CDA credits beneath Baby Smitty's preschool teacher, and all of them felt as though this meta stage play was worth their time. Cloning is occurring. However, I don't know what the consistency was to be able to prove this, but then I realized the truth. It's all in the sounds. When Roz slams the door on Mike's hands, he screams, Yeah! Later, Baby Smitty parrots, I was housey, as if to repeat, mimic, clone. It. Then, as if informed by Boo, he mysteriously stares at Mike's previously damaged hands before chomping on them as hard as he can. And what do we hear? Mike makes the exact same yeah! scream once again. I have reason to believe that anyone who is bit by Baby Smitty is then cloned and prepped to be replaced. It makes sense why this has already happened to Mike and Baby Smitty's very own possible grandmother. It's in the bite, but as you should hear, it's also in the scream. It is a scream extraction. We've established that screams are funnels for the soul and thus, Baby Smitty is cloning people. Gary Gibbs is literally named after Mary Gibbs, which is Boo's real name and Boo's actress's name, and Baby Smitty was the actor for Boo in the stage play. All of the levels of reality are collapsing, and Mike should have taken the hint when his hands were damaged at the end for more reasons than just fixing that damn door. I hate Baby Smitty, the scourge of Monstropolis, the doom of monsters, BNL Leviathan. This is what Baby Smitty is, because this is not. Baby Smitty. Let's be completely clear. The next step is to actually map this Matryoshka and see what BNL's working with. At hypothetical maximum, the infinite Mobius Matryoshka, also known as the nested realities, are 20 dimensional. What I mean is, it would be easier if each film had every other film within it. It would be a diagram that would basically be a circle containing 20 other circles for each subuniverse, which contain 20 more circles infinitely. However, it's clear to me that this is not the case. I need to sift out every plot hole, every detail, every short film, and shared universe. I need to interrelate every Easter egg and display the omniversal container. How does Disney tie in? How do bloopers tie in? The result will be me having to visualize 20 dimensions in a single YouTube video and then proceed to somehow illustrate approximately 20 to the power of 20 diagrams, which would require a hundred septillion pages. I'll have to find a workaround because that's physically impossible, so this will be graduate thesis material and you better stay tuned. This has pushed me so tremendously far over the edge, so subscribe and ring the bell or I'll find you. Until next time, I'm The Theorizer.